Let's open our Bibles together to uh, Revelation chapter 18. We'll be looking today at what is called commercial Babylon. And uh, I'll be giving you quite a bit of information as we look at it. And I mentioned to you last week, you know, that um, I usually keep my notes to about seven pages. Last week were nine. And again, this week is nine. So I went through uh, first service a little bit, and I'm feeling a little more comfortable because there's so much information I want to give to you to help us all to understand what's taking place. And so, um, you know, again, I'll be reading and giving a lot of scripture, as is what I normally do, so that we have a, a, an actual Bible study. And so we'll be looking at these verses in just a moment. John already mentioned uh, that we do have a uh, a trip to Israel planned. If you've never been to Israel or if you've been and would like to go again, you can go to our webpage and get information. We're still setting the dates and we're trying to firm up a price for it, but uh, as much information as we have, we'll give to you. As he mentioned, we have uh, quite a number of people interested in going and I pray they're able to do that. We do have a Wednesday night Bible study as, as mentioned. I'd love to have you with us. I'm looking to the possibility of moving it back into the chapel. We have 760 or 770 seats in there, and we can set it up in such a way as to allow you a uh, uh, section for masks and all of that. And if you feel comfortable with social distancing app, uh, we'll make that possible. So I'm possibly going to do that, not this Wednesday, but the following, just letting you know. We've been going through Job, and uh, it's quite a study. It's quite a uh, a, a great book. And so anyway, I'd invite you to be with us. And then finally, the couples thing with uh, that we're having uh, with Carlos Oscar and everything. He's very funny. And uh, I think you'd appreciate that. Marie and I will be coming. Uh, he, he, we've heard him many times and he, he's very funny. And I think you'd appreciate that as well as the parenting seminar, as John was mentioning, the, uh, that's not just for junior high age parents, you know, parents who have junior hires, not junior hires who are parents. Um, that's what we're trying to prevent. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think you'd appreciate it and uh, would love to have you. Again, what we're going to do now is I'm going to be giving you a lot of foundational information. And I know it can sometimes feel like you're in school or anything like that. And I know many of you loved going to school. But uh, what we're going to do here is I want to lay the foundation and look for some practical application as we continue and go through this. And so, again, I'm going to read just the first few verses, uh, verses 1 through 4. We'll get into our study. We're looking at commercial Babylon, Revelation chapter 18. And John writes, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And so I'm going to give you, as mentioned a moment ago, an introduction. Some of you have gone through Revelation more than once and, and uh, are already pretty much aware of what we'll be looking at. Others perhaps have never gone through the book of Revelation, and it still re remains kind of a mystery to you. And so I want to take you through it and give you some background and lay some foundation. It'll take a little while and then we'll move into our study and see where we can uh, uh, find some application to the things that we're reading here. So I'll begin like this. I'll, I'll remind you that throughout the Bible, there are warnings to those who reject God and those who, who live in a sinful way. Uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are warnings that God gives concerning judgment. For example, in the Old Testament book of Job, we're going through Job right now on Wednesday nights. In the Old Testament book of Job, in chapter 21, verse 30, it reads, For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. 
They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. In Psalm 96, verses 12 and 13, it, it says, Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming. For he's coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and peoples with his truth. And so judgment is spoken of throughout the Old Testament. But we need to remember in the New Testament, we are told that Jesus Christ came to save people from this coming judgment. In John 3, 17, we read, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus Christ came in order that he might bring salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why? Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so we know that God has promised wrath and judgment. You see it throughout the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. Salvation from sins and deliverance from God's wrath were actually a part of the purpose for Jesus' coming. Now, in spite of this, Jesus made it very clear that people who reject him, those who reject him, will be judged. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are going to be people claiming to have known him and done things in his name, even some marvelous things, but he's going to say, I never knew you. I had no relationship with you, and you are actually what he called a worker of lawlessness. Now, remember, in the New Testament, both the apostles Paul and Peter made this judgment very clear in the writings. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, Paul said, The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter said it like this. He said, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So the Old Testament and the New Testament both make it very clear that God is going to bring judgment. Jesus Christ was sent in order to save us from the wrath to come. But those who refuse him will undergo judgment. So in Scripture, the most detailed description of God's judgment on earth is found here in the book of Revelation. When you look at chapters 6 through 18 in Revelation, uh, you have great detail concerning the conditions on, on earth when God brings his judgment. And these, these judgments come in the form of, of various uh, plagues, if you will. And you have various judgments that are described. His wrath is, is displayed in a series of escalating judgments. And John reveals this. He, he speaks of the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. Those are worldwide judgments with the main focus on Antichrist, Babylonian empire. Now, as you read your scripture, and as we went through chapter 17 last time, it appears that during the first half of the tribulation, the Antichrist, the coming world ruler, will establish his religion. And this system, this religious system, will incorporate all the main essentials of the various world religions. It's going to be a unified religious system. It's going to pave the way for a false sense of peace. That's how it's going to take place. But at the midpoint of tribulation, Antichrist will destroy the false religious system. We saw that in chapter 17, verse 16 where it says the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, that's the religious system, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist destroys a false religious system. 
Now, his religious system has incorporated the, the major essentials of all world religions. That, in, that enabled people of different faith traditions to live in peace. Uh, Jews rebuild the temple. Muslims coexist, as do other faith systems. But Christianity, Christianity, as you read through the Revelation, has been excluded. Why? Because Christians worship Christ, our Messiah. And because Christians refuse to conform to his system, Christians will be persecuted to the death. In Revelation 17, verse 6, uh, that verse speaks of the religious system that is drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist will break his covenant that he has with the Jewish nation. He, he's tired of using the false system. He now expects the world to worship him alone. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27, speaking of Antichrist, it says that he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That seven is a seven-year period for, for seven years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Daniel 11:36. speaking of the Antichrist called the king or the willful king, it says the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. So Antichrist will destroy the false system and will replace it with the world worshiping him. He will destroy mystery Babylon, as we saw in chapter 17. But he makes worship of him mandatory. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 in the New Testament said that he'll oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So at this point, his religious system is absorbed into what has been called his commercial empire. Religion is not abolished, but is now directed only to the Antichrist. So as we look at chapter 18, we're going to be looking at his commercial empire. And that chapter gives us insight into the destruction of the last and the greatest human empire. Today we're going to be looking at commercial Babylon. Now notice in verse 1 here in chapter 18 where it says, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. So after these things indicates that this is a later revelation. It's later than the one that we saw in chapter 17. Again, in chapter 17, we had a look at Mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Mystery Babylon speaks of that system that dominates the world during the tribulation. It's economic and political, and it's a religious system that is established by Antichrist. And so as we looked at chapter 17, we saw the religious aspect, Mystery Babylon. Chapter 18 speaks of the commercial quality and how God will destroy it. Again, in chapter 17, Mystery Babylon is identified as a religious system that influences the world. And she was sitting on many waters, which verse 15 of chapter 17 identified as people and nations. And that identified the religious system as having worldwide influence. So Mystery Babylon is a system influencing the world in chapter 17. But as we get into chapter 18, chapter 18 refers to Babylon as a city five times. You'll see it in verse 10 and 16, verse 18, 19, and 21. So that makes us believe that it's the city of Babylon that is being spoken of literally, and that Babylon will be Antichrist's headquarters. Now I'm going to develop this a little bit further for you. In the Old Testament, there are prophecies that speak of the destruction of Babylon. Isaiah 13, 19 through 22 says, And Babylon, the jewel of the kingdom, the glory of the pride of the Chaldeans, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or settled from generation to generation. No nomad will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flock there. But desert creatures will lie down there, and howling creatures will fill her houses. Ostriches will dwell there, wild goats will leap about, hyenas will howl in her fortresses and jackals in her luxurious palaces. Babylon's time is at hand, 
and her day will not be prolonged. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 13, it says, because of the Lord's anger, she will not be inhabited, but will be completely desolate. All who pass Babylon will be appalled. They will scoff because of all her wounds. And then in the same chapter, Jeremiah 50, verse 39, it goes on to say, desert creatures and hyenas will live there. There the owl will dwell. It will never again be, be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. So the prophecy of the complete destruction of Babylon has yet to be fulfilled. Babylon exists today. In 1983, Saddam Hussein ordered the rebuilding of Babylon. The site was open to tourists in, in 2009, but there's really not much left to see. In 2019, UNESCO, a uh, branch of the United Nations, designated Babylon as a World Heritage Site. There's a commentator by the name of Henry Morris, and he wrote about Babylon in his book, The Revelation Record. And in his book, Morris spoke of the work being done to rebuild ancient Babylon. And this is what he said. He said, never has a great world city had such a meteoric rise as New Babylon, and never will one experience such a cataclysmic and total fall. Babylon on the Euphrates has lain dormant and foreboding for centuries. But mighty Babylon is not really dead. Suddenly, it will rise once again. Under the impact of overwhelming geopolitical needs, it will be authorized and implemented by the unprecedented building program undertaken by the federal Ten Kingdom Empire of the West, then pushed to dynamic completion by the beast, Antichrist. Finally, it will be inaugurated as the great world capital of the beast, who will have become king of all the kingdoms of the globe. There's a, a, a man by the name of Joel Rosenberg, and he has a blog, and he wrote, skeptics and cynics abound, to be sure. But the fact is, Babylon is being rebuilt right now, in part with U.S. taxpayer funds. Iraqi leaders hope that eventually millions of tourists will come to visit, and real progress is being made. Consider the June of 2009 edition of Stars and Stripes, a, a U.S. military publication. They had a fascinating story that was headlined, U.S. Iraqi experts developing plan to preserve Babylon, build local tourism interest, industry. Babylon under Antichrist will be rebuilt and become the capital city of his empire. So as the capital, it'll be the center of his commercial empire. Now, over the years of the tribulation, Babylon has grown in prestige and influence. During the tribulation, warnings to the world, including to Babylon, are given of a coming judgment. Remember, we've seen 144,000 evangelists. We've seen two witnesses. We've seen converts and an angel, and they're proclaiming the everlasting gospel. As we saw chapter 14, uh, in the tribulation, an angel cried out, of Babylon's destruction. We saw in Revelation 14, 8, how it said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. While the angel was crying out the certainty of judgment, a judgment that was soon to come. You see, this call for repentance fell on deaf ears. The majority of the world hearing it still rejects it. In Revelation 16, 9, we saw Men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. People don't repent. They hear the message. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to act on it. And that's taking place now, but that also takes place in the last days. That's going to take place in, during the, the tribulation. There'll be so many opportunities to turn to Christ. God is still sending messengers and telling people, come to faith turn away from your wickedness, but they refuse to do that. We, we'll see this in just a moment in more detail here in chapter 18. But the call for repentance falls on deaf ears. The majority of the world don't want to hear anything. So we saw already that, that judgment on mystery Babylon, but we're going to see now the judgment on what is called commercial Babylon. And so when he says again in verse 1, after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven 
Well, that informs us that this is a new vision. Speaking of commercial Babylon, another angel differentiates this angel from the one that we saw in chapter 17, verse 1. This may be the angel spoken of in Revelation 14 that was crying out, Babylon is fallen. It's a very powerful angel, one who's going to do a great work for the Lord. And that's made clear by the statement of the illumination of the earth by its glory. Remember, in the fifth bold judgment, Antichrist's throne and kingdom had been darkened. This bright light now shocks and even terrifies those who see it. And so he says in verse 2, and, the, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And so when he cries out, is fallen, is fallen, that speaks of a sudden and complete action. What had been spoken of in chapter 14 is finally and completely fulfilled. Now, we saw the bold judgments, and we saw the seventh judgment speaking of Jerusalem and Babylon. In Revelation 16, 19, it said, Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Well, Babylon is now fallen. And when it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that could speak of two separate stages. It could re reveal two aspects of the fall of Babylon, her false re religious system as well as her commercial system. Now, the events of chapter 18 are going to be taking place during the last half of the seven-year period of the tribulation. Again, it seems that the first three and a half years are consummated at the destruction of Mystery Babylon. That religious system will no longer be necessary. The world church will be destroyed in favor of a world honor of the Antichrist. And so at the end of the first three and a half years of the tribulation, mystery Babylon is dealt with, but in the second half, political or commercial Babylon is also dealt with. Now notice again in verse 2 that it has become a habitation of demons, a prison for foul spirits and hated birds. In chapter 9, spoke of demons that were released at the abyss in the fifth trumpet. It spoke of 200 million demons being released in the sixth trumpet. Now, these demons would also include those who were cast out of heaven with Satan in chapter 12 and all other demons on the earth. So Babylon has become a habitation. Notice a prison is a cage for demons and for unclean or hated birds. Now, you see this in Isaiah 14, 22 and 23, where God said, I'll rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will cut off from Babylon her name and survivors, her offspring and descendants, declares the Lord I will turn her into a place for owls and into a swamp land. I will sweep her with a broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. And so he's speaking concerning this now, how it's become this, a prison. In verse 3, all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Now, this this. Judgment comes on Babylon because of the total wickedness of her inhabitants. Her religious, political, and commercial dealings have polluted the world, and the people have become rich through them. She's become the merchandising capital of the world, filled with greedy exploiters. The wealth accumulated by the apostate church is taken over by the political system, and her commercial enterprise has made many greedy and materialistic people extremely rich. The merchants of the earth become rich through the abundance notice of her luxury. So this temptation to become rich, this temptation for extreme riches has seduced them into yielding their very souls to this system. In 1 Timothy, Paul had written, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. The rich man is asked, how much is enough? And he says, a little bit more. There's this, eyes of man are never satisfied. We have a little bit, but we want a lot. Well, that spirit is going to be completely blossoming during the time of uh, Antichrist. And commercial Babylon is going to be utilized for a lot of people to become extremely, extremely rich. And they're going to become full of abundance in verse 4, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, 
lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Come out of her. There's a call for people to come out, to come out. Now notice he says, I heard another voice, another voice of the same kind. In other words, the this, this speaker is an angel, but it's making a call. Come out of her, my people. So that's a call for God's people to reject and flee from Antichrist system. I've been asked this question in the past, and the answer will be this. They'll say, are people going to get saved in the tribulation? And the answer is yes. It's been said that the, the tribulation period will be one of the most incredible times of, of uh, awakening, that there'll be so many people coming to faith in Christ. Again, there are 144,000 spirit-filled witnesses preaching the gospel, 144,000 Billy Graham types. There'll be the two witnesses who, who perform miracles and are protected by the Lord, and, and they're preaching. Then you have that angel that is flying with the everlasting gospel. You have people who have been saved, who are taking their very lives into their hands and tell people about the salvation that's been given to them through Christ. So there'll be many people who are coming to faith, and many of the converts are going to be martyred. They're going to be martyred because, remember, during this time, there's going to be a system, a marking system. It's called, we call it the mark of the beast. And there are going to be many who are martyred because they refuse to take the mark. I've had people say to me, well, you know, I want to live around. I want to see what's going on. And, uh, and, and I won't take the mark. So, so I slap them. So that's, <laughs> that's not true. If you can't live for Christ now, what makes you think you'll die for him then? You're not going to. Of course, you're going to take that mark. You have to be aware of these things. Because there are going to be people who aren't converted, and, and they will be martyred. There's going to be a time of great martyr. Again, martyrdom, you know, that the, the false system is drunk on the blood of the martyrs. There, there are many martyrs, people who are dying. There are going to be people who are tempted by their family and their friends. They're going to say, you need to take it. We don't want you to die. What's the big deal? It's not really a mark that matters at all. You need to buy. You need to sell. They're going to kill you, and they're going to be pressuring their family and, and they're going to say, you need to take that mark. There's going to be a lot of economic pressure. And they may begin to feel at that time, I, I have to take it. If I don't take that mark, I'm not going to survive. My kids aren't going to eat. You know, there's so much pressure and all of that. But what does the Bible say? Well, they're called, believers are called to flee from her. Come out of her is what it says. Flee from her. Don't share in her sins. Now, it's interesting when you read this in verse 4, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. That reminds me of something Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, where Paul wrote, therefore come out from them and be separate, saith the Lord, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's something we're already called to right now. Come out of that system. You know, the church, I was mentioning the first service, the word church in the original language in Greek, it's called Koine Greek. The word church is ekklesia. Ekklesia literally means the called out ones. The church has been called out. We're called out of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We're here, but we're salt and we're light. We're not supposed to partake in the things of the world, but rather we're supposed to share with the world that there's an answer, that you don't need to think that these are the things that will fulfill your life, that something greater is possible through Christ. That's what we do when we preach the gospel. We tell people you can buy things, you can have so many things, many cars, nice homes and all of that. And who's to say there's anything wrong with that at all? It's nothing wrong with that. Give me one of your cars. I, I, I love you. But it, it's the worship of those things. It's making that the center of your whole life. It's the system that denies the reality of God and rewards that come through following Christ and, and says your, your greatest moment is now. Get as much as you can now. But the Bible says here, and it says in 2 Corinthians, come out, be separate. You see, by not participating in her sins, they're not going to receive her punishment. And these judgments would be specific judgments. Judgments that are brought on Babylon. 
Now, in verse 5, it says, Her sins have reached to heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. This is an interesting verse. When it says her sins have reached, that word reached in the original language is a, a word that could be used speaking of piling up bricks. And it's actually a picture or a reminder of the Tower of Babel, how that, that tower was built to reach unto heaven. And so what's being said here is her sins have been piled up like bricks to heaven, and God is remembered. Her sins are piled up like a new Tower of Babel. This time, they have gotten God's notice in a special way. They didn't reach heaven because um, of anything other than the fact that God has noticed what they're doing. In other words, God doesn't forget their sins, and God is judging them. In, in the book of Jonah, remember that book of the reluctant prophet, and he was called to preach to Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, God had said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry against it. And he went on to say, For their wickedness is come up before me. It's a way of saying God has remembered. Their wickedness has come up before me. And so he goes on to say in verse 6, Render to her just as she has rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. And so this angel is speaking and the angel is not speaking to John. The angel is speaking to the judge. He's, he's speaking to God himself. And this is what he's saying. He's saying there needs to be swift and just judgment in keeping with her bloody persecution of the saints. That's been called uh, keeping with the principle of fair and proportionate justice. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's proportionate justice. And so when he speaks concerning rendering, that word render means to give back that which is due. They have sown and therefore may they reap. In Psalm 137, 8 and 9, it says, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you've done to us. He who seizes your infants dashes them against the rocks. She considered herself invulnerable. May her judgment be swift and severe. It says in verse 7, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, Give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. So she says in her heart, I, I sit as the queen. She glorifies herself instead of glorifying God. She indulges her flesh and she's arrogant. So give to her in the same measure. In other words, give her torment, give her sorrow. And by the way, that would be a description of hell. In verse 8, it says, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Her plagues come in one day. Babylon's destruction is not going to be progressive. It's not going to just slowly but surely be judged. It's going to be sudden. The city is going to be instantly destroyed. Think for a moment of anything that you've ever seen, any history uh, on the History Channel or in school. The, uh, the, the films of, of Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima and how you see the, the bomb explode and you see as it just generates all of that energy. It's in a moment. It's just gone. And that's the picture that is given to us here. It's something that happens instantly. It's not, it's not something that progressively is going to happen. It's going to fall. Now, she is boasting. She boasted of her glory. She boasted of her luxury, but she loses it in an instant. Death, mourning, and famine hit her. And in the end, she's destroyed. Verse 8, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. 
For strong is the Lord God. What God is determined to do, he will do. And no one can stop him. Again, it's like in Job 42, verse 2. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And so he's speaking of this instant destruction. And then, verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, and wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit of your soul, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. Those are cheery words, huh? Now notice, verse 9, how they see the smoke of her burning and cry, and they lament. They lament at her sudden destruction. In one hour, in other words, quickly, in one hour, the mighty city has undergone sudden and complete devastation. Isaiah 13, 6 and 7 says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. In verse 11, it speaks of the merchants of the earth, how they're weeping and mourning. Why? Because no one's buying from them anymore. Their riches, their opulent lifestyles have come to an immediate and crashing halt. They are immediately bankrupt. They lose every single thing in a moment that they valued. They were oblivious to and completely opposed to placing things in heaven. They, they didn't care about a relationship with God. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, where he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. What you have taken a lifetime to accumulate can be gone in a moment. Anybody who invests in stock in stock exchange and all of that, you know that. Anybody who puts a lot of money and puts all their stock on stock, they, they, they discover that, that the, the stock market goes up and it goes down. You can, you can become rich in a moment and you can be broke in a moment. And that's why Jesus taught us not about the stock market so much, but as to what really value, what we should really value, what we should really desire. And what he said you really should desire is something that is permanent, something that is in heaven, not things on the earth. He says you can have gold and you can have clothing, but rust, uh, rust and moth will destroy those things. Lay your treasures in heaven. Why? Because where your, your heart is, there shall your treasure also be. And so that's what he teaches. That's what Jesus taught. But these people did not do that. These people were making so much money, they couldn't believe it. And the swift destruction of Babylon stuns them. They reel over what has happened. All of the luxury items that they had are gone. When you read verses 12 through 14, that's a list of luxury items that were sources of immense wealth. And these items give us a picture of opulence and the luxury that they, that they live with. But what's interesting is when you see all of these things in verse 13, notice cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots. All of those are things that very rich people had and they mark it in. But notice what else? Bodies and souls of men. Trafficking. They trafficked in human beings, slavery. Even today, as we see the trafficking of human beings, even at this time, there's still trafficking going on even right now throughout this world, throughout this world. 
And what's happening is they made money off of people. Not only all these goods, but they also made money off of people. And they also basically seduced the souls of men. This is simply a partial picture of gaining all that the world has to offer them. And Jesus said something about that in Matthew 16, 26, when he said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? Well, their God was materialism. Its cost was the souls of men. They prostituted themselves. Listen, guys, we're in the 21st century. We see this as being something even around us right now. Maybe not to the degree that it will be in the very last days, no. But we see it already. This already happens. This is already in existence. These people prostituted themselves for materialism. There was a greed within them that, that drove them on. We know that today, and I didn't take the time to, to, to get any stats on this, but we all know this already, that billions today are made, billions are made from the sale of alcohol. Billions are made through gambling and prostitution. Billions are made through the sale of pornography and, and illegal drugs. And today we are seeing the fruit of human trafficking and we're seeing the destruction. Well, this is something that is gonna to come to full bloom during this period. Notice verse 15, the merchants of these things who became rich by her will, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? They threw dust on, on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she's made desolate. And so they see this taking place and they're weeping and they're mourning. And it's interesting how it speaks of them standing at a distance weeping. They weep and they mourn, but it's not out of sympathy. It's not because people have died in this terrible thing. No, it's because they lost their riches, that their sources of material luxury and pleasure are gone, and it's gone in an instant. When it speaks in verse 17 of the shipmaster, those who travel by sea and all, these are the ones who made their living transporting luxury items. And again, in a moment, they're gone. And what is their response? Well, it says they throw dust on their head. They cry out. They lament. It's all gone. And as they're doing this, verse 20, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Now, the believers in heaven are actually encouraged to rejoice. Why? Because God has answered the prayer. God has avenged you on those who martyred you. So instead of weeping over this, rejoice that God has heard you. And then finally, verse 21, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So finally, verse 21, another strong angel throws a millstone into the sea. And a millstone is very heavy and it will just drop and sink immediately. And so like that millstone sinking instantly, Babylon in an instant will also disappear. Notice it says, no one will be making music 
No one will be working a job. No one will be making food. The city is going to be completely dead. It's abandoned. It's empty. It's destroyed. There will be no more falling in love. No more getting married. It's all gone forever. Why is that? Well, because your great and wealthy men were materialists and heartless. They used their wealth to abuse others and were in love with power and prominence. And second, by your sorcery, you deceived the world. Your occult influence blinded people from the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to share with you just a couple of minutes about this as we're about to close. Sorcery. In the, in the time of, of the New Testament writing, in the Old Testament also, you'll find the word sorcerer. The sorcerers in the old as well as the new were, were those who, who, um, who would use drugs. They used drugs in the, um, in the different kinds of uh, ceremonies that they had. And sometimes the sorcerer would drug somebody as they were taking control of their mind. And they would use the drugs to do that, and, and it would alter their perception of reality. And so the word sorcery is actually the Greek word pharmakeia. And the word pharmakeia is where we today get the word pharmaceutical. And so the word sorcery is not just in reference to occult practices, though it does refer to that, but it is also speaking of drug use. And so drug use, according to Galatians chapter 5, is a work of the flesh. It speaks of sorcery there, but it's not simply a cult that it's speaking about. It's speaking of recreational use of a, of a drug in order to alter your perception of reality. And so as a Christian, you know, I'm aware that drugs are forbidden of the Lord to be used with the voluntary altering of my perception. It's something that I'm not to, to be involved in. When I first got saved, I had a friend of mine who was, you know, telling me, well, you know what? You know, drugs are okay. You know, God created weed. We used to call it herb. This is a long time ago. Maybe I have some gray hairs in here. I might remember that. We called it, we called it herb. And one of my friends said, wait a minute. The Bible says that God created the herb and that it's good. Like it was dope, right? Like it was marijuana. And I said, are you telling me that God, and this, I was a brand new Christian when I said this, are you telling me that God created dope so I could get loaded? Is that what you're saying? That the herb is, he was speaking of marijuana. Is that what you're saying? He goes, yeah, God created it. I said, listen, God created poison ivy, but I don't use it as toilet paper. So come on. I mean, I'm, and I was a brand new Christian. That just didn't make sense to me then. It doesn't now. Are you kidding me? You know, just because it was created doesn't make it good. Just because it's part of nature doesn't make it good. And just because it's part of nature now doesn't mean it was originally in, intended for the use that we find ourselves using it in our day. You just can't make that argument. But people voluntarily will use drugs to alter their perception. And I was sharing this with first service, and I, I actually was a little reserved when I did so. But I'll say it second, too, um, simply because it was, it was true in my testimony, which is this, before I got saved, you know, as a young person from the age of 17 till I was 20, how many of you know my testimony. I'm not going into it, but I did use uh, acid. I, I did like acid, and so I used acid on occasion. And when I used acid, I liked it because it altered perception. And one of the things that we were told back at that time, some of you may be old enough to remember this, and some of you remember it, but you pretend you forgot because you don't want to admit you're so old. But at that time, we, we would use it, and we were told, use it to alter reality. Use it to tune into the other. We used to call spiritual things the other. So you can tune into the other, the other reality. You know, you know. You remember the group, the Doors. I'm, I'm, I'm floating. Here we go. Um, well, the Doors. You know where they were called? The Doors. They were called the Doors because that was from Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception. And the Doors would use that term, the Doors, to speak about otherworldly experiences and things like that. See, so that was part of what I grew up with, and that's part of what I knew. And so to take acid was to open the doors of perception so that I can make a connection with the other, with the other reality, the spiritual truth that's out there. 
And that's what was going on in the 60s and into 1970. And so drugs were used by not everybody, but by some to try and connect with the supernatural. Eventually, transcendental meditation came in and people said you can have the same kind of perception by doing TM, but that's another study in the future. But that's what they said, you don't need acid. You can learn how to alter your perception and reality and have something very similar to an acid trip and we can teach you how to do that through meditation. So that was going on in the late 60s and into 70s. I got saved in 1970. But I knew then and I know now, I knew then that that could be a door to something else. I know now that it's forbidden by God. It's forbidden by God. If I want to connect with, quote, unquote, the other, I come to him through Jesus Christ. And he's not just a power. He's a person. And he has a relationship. And he loves. He's not just some energy out there in, in, that you tap into through meditation. He is a person who has a relationship with you, who loves, who actually has a demonstration of love by giving his son Jesus Christ. Well, these people here are into the sorcery. They were into that other experience of some sort. They took the drugs. They tried to perceive reality or the other in the supernatural. And he said, no. He said, it was by your sorcery that they were deceived. And so sorcery has blinded you. And then finally, he says, you martyred the believers in Christ, and for this you've been judged. Remember again in Revelation 6, verse 10, how the martyrs said, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. How long? Well, in the judgment of Babylon, this prayer is answered. Now, in a, in a second, in a moment, it's gone. It's done with. There'll be merchants standing afar off weeping because they lost their source of income because for them, greed and materialism and making so much money off of those who could hardly afford was what they liked. Is that possible? I'll close with a couple of thoughts. Do we really think that's true? Yeah. Uh, the first house I ever bought, first house I ever bought cost me $47,000. I'll let that sink in some of you young people. Here in California, $500 a month house payment. And I told my dad, I can't believe this, dad. I'm spending $500 a month for rent. And my dad says to me, son, one of these days, you're going to be thinking that's not very much at all. I said, I hope I never see that day. I see it. <laughs> I, I see it now. You can have a house that should be burned down. The backyard just has dirt. You, you grow nice dirt, and that's about it, and some weeds. And you've got a bathroom that's falling apart. And you can sell that house for $400,000 pretty easily, right? Somebody's going to walk up, do you know where that's at? I'll buy it, you know, $400,000. Did you ever think that would take place? Did you ever, did you ever think that here in Chino, in Chino, not Beverly Hills, we're talking about Chino, that houses would cost as much as they do? I had somebody saying that. I can't afford to live in Chino. Really, that's how much houses have gone up? Isn't that amazing, right? When's it going to stop? It will stop. Every bubble bursts eventually. But we already see that. And, I, and I'm not going to call a person who's a business person who's making money off a house. I'm not, I'm not going to call you greedy, by the way. I'm not. I'm really not. I find it interesting that the house that you buy for $450,000 here, you can go to Texas and get a half acre, 2,000 square foot home. I'm not telling you to. But if you do, will you invite me over? You know, um, <laughs> you can get that for $350,000. A nice home. I have a friend of mine who just bought a house in, in uh, Idaho. It's a 3,000 square foot house on a half acre for $450,000. You know, but homes, we're watching, we're watching things go up to the point where how are my children going to buy a house? 
like my, my, my son Joseph and Karina. Um, they're living with us right now because they sold their home because they want to buy a home. And they're out there in the homes are seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars Homes that last year would have been for four fifty, five hundred, five fifty, maybe. It's just exploding. So we say to ourselves, is this, is this true? Yes, these things that we just looked at in verses 12 following, those are all luxury items. And these merchants who were shipping and these people who were selling, these people were making money hand over fist. They were rich, but they were greedy, and they were making money off of luxury items and even the sale of human beings and stealing of human souls. Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so God says, or the word says to us, uh, rejoice, because the judgment has finally fallen. And commercial Babylon, the financial political arm of Antichrist kingdom, in one hour has been judged. And the trauma of that is exceptional. We'll close with that with one last word. Next week, we get to see the return of Jesus Christ. And that I'm looking forward to now. After this. After this. And Father, we bless you and we thank you for your promises, for your word is sure, and we trust you. And I would ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that we would make sure where we stand with you. Because, Lord, you say, come out from her. And, Lord, I pray that every person who's listening to this message has come out from the world and have come to you, separated from the world, separated unto you. But even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some right now who haven't separated, who haven't come to the Lord yet. And this is an opportunity for you to do that as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed. If you need to get right with the Lord, you can do so. If you're watching online or in one of the overflows, you can do so. If you need to get right with God right now before we close this service, you can do, do that right where you're at. You can say, God, be merciful to me. Forgive me. I want to be one of yours. I want to come out of this, and I want to be part of what you would have me to be. I want to be changed. I want my sins forgiven. I want to connect with you. And if you have that desire, I want to pray for you. And if you need that right now, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Just raise your hand. Father, you see these hands that are going up throughout this place right now. In Jesus' name, I ask that you would reach down and touch each person whose hand is raised to you. Father, I pray that you would wash and cleanse, and by your Spirit you would settle within. May their lives be forever changed from this moment on. May they serve you and love you, and Lord, may they be a, an open testimony of your grace. We give to you praise for this now, and we receive by faith. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. And we just receive by faith his forgiveness. And may you enter into our lives, Lord to every person whose hand is raised by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Bless you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I pray, keep moving in all of us to your glory. In your name, amen.